All right, welcome to week 10, I think, maybe 11, but I think it's, no, it's 11, week 11. So what are you starting today? We're starting with, I knew I should have waited another 30 seconds. <laughs> um, anyways, week 11, we're going to start with, uh, maybe getting my laptop to cooperate, shell scripting. Now, Depending on who teaches this to you, they treat it one of two ways. Um, they either assume you're all idiots and hold you by the hand and teach you what a for loop is, what a variable is, and what an if statement is. Considering you're at level two and you're finishing your second level of programming, I sure as heck hope you know what a variable is, a loop is, and a conditional is. And if you don't know, you're in the wrong program. Just putting the thought out there. So the way I do it is I just go over explaining what the, how, they, how this stuff works in Linux. And then the labs are actually fairly decent exercises to go with these lectures that I can help you in lab individually if you're having a hard time with it. So I'm going to go over the concepts, show you guys the differences between this and Java or whatever else you may have learned. And we'll go with that. Now, for starters, shell scripting is a file that contains commands that a shell can execute. Uh, you guys learned how to make batch files in Computer Essentials, right? Maybe. They used to teach it. Yeah, if they did, <laughs> then this is the same idea, but this is Linux versions of batch files. So, whereas with DOS batch files, or Windows batch files, you had to actually get extra utilities to actually do stuff like menus and whatnot, you can do that all built into the shell commands. Um, it's a combination of programming logic and operating system commands. So you can mix match any command you've learned in this course, as well as um, the built-in, what they call the helper functionality in the shell. Um, the big perk is it lets you automate stuff you do on a regular basis. Uh, you want to get into a routine that automatically checks in your files when you're done developing, and then it, it pushes them to a server and then updates the server and you just want to run one command to make it happen, you can do that with the shell script. Um, you want to automate your nightly backup jobs for the database servers, you can do that also with a shell script. Stuff is sequential. It runs top to bottom. Now, object-oriented programmers have a hard time with the concept of top to bottom programming. Clue you in. It starts at the top, and it does every command until it reaches the bottom. When I went to school, that's how we learned how to program, because object orientation was like, C++ existed, but it was like this, this little elite group of freaks that used it. We programmed using COBOL and BASIC, Fortran, RPG. Those were the, were the, the choice of the tools of the day. Um, so basically, it's top to bottom program. Uh, you can have functions. That's included. That's like two lectures from now. Um, you can change the order of operations using loops and decision-making operators and functions, but, you know, essentially it runs from top to bottom. And obviously in the end, a shell script is a program all said and done. Now, characteristics of a shell script. It's a scripting language. If you don't know what the difference is between a scripting language, a regular language, a scripting language is not compiled. That means when you run the command, it tries to run everything inside of it. It doesn't run through a pre-parser like it does with Java and tells you how to launch. Uh, it doesn't compile it to bytecode that runs faster. It's never going to run any faster or any slower than what your machine's capable of. It's a high-level language. In other words, it's not assembly. It's interpreted. as basically goes back to the fact that it's a scripting language. Other examples of interpreted languages that you may have heard of, Python, PHP, Ruby, those are scripting, uh, scripted, interpreted, interpreted languages. It's also weakly typed. That's the first problem that people that come out of languages like Java and C have a hard time with. Variables can be anything. And you can make it be anything from a Boolean to an integer to a character back to a Boolean. You can treat a Boolean like a character. You can treat an integer like a character. So if you want to know what the third number from the left is, you can. If you also want to treat it as a number, you can multiply, multiply this exact same variable to something else. 
Um, weekly type is great because you don't have to think about what the data type is. Weekly type sucks because, well, you never know what the data type is. So in contrast, Java is object oriented. I hope you know that by now. It's a high, also high level language. It's what they call a hybrid compiled language. In case you don't know what that is, is it looks at the code, it does an initial pass, it does a compile to byte, byte pieces, and then it runs the byte code using the, the JRE. Whereas C is a fully compiled language where you know it compiles it, gives you an executable or a DLL or an SO file. Uh, Java is also strongly typed. In other words, you can't make an integer into a character unless you use a function to make the integer into a character. They're you know, it's not a, it can't be an integer and a character at the same time. Okay. So, there's a few simple s examples here. These are stupid examples. But the, the first one actually has, when it goes, um, let's say I had a function called who's on. And what it does, outputs the date outputs a line and then it lists out who's currently logged in. List root goes to the root and then lists the contents of the root folder and outputs what the present working directory is. As you can see, these are just standard commands that you've been running at the command line, except you can put them in a file. Um, one of the special things, though, that you have to do is, For a second, I had a moment of fear. I thought I forgot to hit the record button. Uh, when you want to execute the files, one of the funny things about Linux is you can have an executable file, but Linux won't let you execute it. By the same token, you can have a file that you think could never be executable and you can make it executable. Why? chmod. You make it executable by giving it the executable bit. And at that point, you can now run the script file. So it's literally a text file with commands inside of it. You turn on the executable a bit, and now it's a program. It's like magic. So suddenly, you could just go dot slash whatever it's called, and it'll run. You don't need to run it. It'll just run. Um, you guys know about path variables? Same idea under Linux that it is under Windows. If you want to find a program, you put it in the path. Therefore, if you have custom scripts you've written for yourself, you probably want to throw that in your path so that you don't constantly need to use the full, fully declared path you know, to find your scripts. Um, how do you modify your path? There's the line. Path equals path plus a little extra stuff. Um, if... You have a shell script that you want to run but is not executable yet. You don't want to let everybody run it yet. You can prefix it with the word bash because you're in a bash shell. You can go bash space script file. Suddenly it'll read the contents of the script file, launch a, co a custom shell of its own. So it's going to run inside its own little shell temporarily. So it's isolated from everything else. Um, if you don't want to start a new shell, you can also use dot, run in current shell. All right, so when you look, and there's, I've got examples at the end of the presentation of what some of this stuff is. But the very first line of any shell script, you have to tell it what the command interpreter is. Now, what's cool about shell scripts that is different than pretty much anything else you'll ever work with is you can write shell scripts in different languages. So you'd have four shell script on your shell scripts defined in your wherever you put your shell scripts. And you can actually write them in four different languages if you want. If the first example in red here is, you know, uh, hash mark, exclamation mark, slash bin, slash bash. And that's telling it we're going to run this script using bin bash, so basically bash. The second one is TCSH. There's actually a shell called TCSH, which runs a C-like language instead. Uh, you can also go bin Perl, bin PHP, bin Python. So you could actually run, write your scripts in Python, your shell scripts in Python. If you want to actually have a real programming language that's not broken, you could write it in Python. Or in Perl, which is, you know, a language. 
all its own. I'd rather write stuff in shell scripts than, Py than Perl any day. But each language is different. So what you do with shell scripts is you define, you pick the language that's best for the job you want to do. You want to work with strings, you use Perl. You want to do low-level system stuff, probably want to pull up Python. You need to move some files around, use Bash. Pick the, uh, pick the scripting language that matches what you need. The next important thing you need to know is how to make comments in your files. Uses the pound symbol, also known as the hash mark. And no, it's not called hashtag. God, that pisses me off. That's because I'm old. But yes, it's a hash mark. Um, essentially, any line that starts with a hash is a comment. Pretty simple. Uh, we don't have um, comment blocks. So for those of you that are used to doing the sl uh, slash star star slash bit like in Java, you don't got that. If you want multi-line comments, you're putting pound signs all the way down. So it's all good. It is what it is. Uh, it can be anywhere in the script. So it can be on its own line. It can be at the end of a line. Put it wherever you want. Anything after the pound sign is a comment, essentially. Now, if pound sign is the first comment, uh, character of a line, and you have an uh, exclamation mark, then um, it thinks it's actually, you're giving uh, what's called directives. But if it's just a pound mark and anything else but an exclamation mark, then it's not a directive, it's just a comment. So just careful with the exclamation mark, the pound exclamation mark combo. You should only ever really see that on the first line of your script. All right. Variables. You guys know what a variable is, right? Like, I mean, come on, Katie. Pretty soon you're going to make me start wonder. Um, but you guys know what variables is in Java. Same idea in shell scripts. This set of slides, this one, next one, we're assuming we're working with Bash, not Python or Perl or whatever else. So a variable is a variable. It's a bin. It's a container that holds strings and numbers. You can do pretty much anything you want with it like you can in any language. You can change the values, manipulate them, move them around, that kind of stuff. And because it's an interpreted language and it's loosely typed, you don't need to declare your variables. You just use them right away. So you make figments of your imagination become true immediately without having to tell it what kind of imagination it is. So unlike in Java, where if you want to have a variable and you need to declare what type of variable is going to be, you know, this variable is a string, this one's a date, this one's a Boolean, this is an integer or a float. You don't do that with it. This one here, you just go date now equals date. Done. Now it now contains current date. Um, to assign them, variable equals value. Uh, however, here's one that throws a lot of people for a loop when they come in from other languages. It cares about the spaces. You cannot have spaces in your assignment. So name equals value. It's not name space equals space value. That's going to shit the bed. It's just name equals value. If you want to assign a variable, it has to be all glued together. That's just the way it is. However, if you want to access your variable, but only if you want to read the value of the variable, nothing else. You just not to set it, not to do math on it. You just want to get the contents of it. You got to put a dollar sign in front of it. Why? Pfft. Who knows? But that's what they chose. So, for example, my var is being set to something. If you go echo my var is now dollar sign my var, it's actually an output. The word my var is, equal, is now and then is going to output the value of my var. So if you don't f have the dollar sign in front of it, it treats it as a string, unless it's part of an assignment operator. 
you can also use double quote marks. And if you're going to copy paste out of the slides, if you download the slides, you copy paste, you'll notice all the quote marks are broken. They're smart quotes. Microsoft does things to quote marks. Um, you can also echo using quotation marks. Okay, math. Oh boy. Math is a good time. Uh, no, not really. Do you notice something funny about this? Anyone want to take a guess what looks kind of funny about this? The double parentheses. Anybody here ever see a language called Lisp? If you've ever seen Lisp, this looks familiar. Whoever decided to create the Bash scripting language decided to grab parts of every random language on Earth and go, the guy goes, oh, that's cool, I'll use Lisp for this. Oh, that looks, I will use another language for that. So every piece looks like it's been ripped from a different language. This is how you set values in Lisp, by the way. If ever you want to learn Lisp, which is an absolutely nightmarish language to learn, it only has 10 commands. So double brackets means it's an expression. That means you're going to do some math in here. Double bracket variable name is equal to, you know, mathematical operation. Or if you just want to run it right away, you don't have to do the assignment in there either. You can just go double brackets value operator value two. I've got examples in a bit. And some of the operators you're allowed to use, plus plus, minus minus. Somebody said, that's cool, we'll borrow C and C's version of increment and decrement. Uh, however, it doesn't do pre-increment and it doesn't do pre-decrement. Uh, in C light languages, you can actually go plus plus variable name instead of variable name plus plus. And it actually means something different. And I don't know, personally I don't know what the difference is, but apparently it does something different. You can do the same thing with the negative. You can put the double negative in front of the variable name. Two asterisks. It's an exponent. Two, so you go, say, three, two asterisks, two. You're going three to the power of two. And hopefully my math isn't too bad, which is nine. Um, six. It's been a while. One star is now is multiply. Slashes divide, percent signs the remainder. So that's actually the same as pretty much every language. Addition, subtraction. And division, I notice, is misspelled. I'll have to talk to Hubert. <laughs> so here's a few examples. Set count equal to 10 plus 20. If you go echo count, guess what, it's, what it is? 30. Let's not make Dan do math. Apparently he can't. Counts equal to count plus one. Guess what just happened? What's count worth now? Anybody? 31. And if I go count plus plus, now what's count worth? 32. Now, the next line If I go echo dollar sign, then I got a bunch of brackets. What it's actually going to do, it's going to go count is equal to 2 to the power of 3. Treat that piece of math as a variable and output it. So you know when Java, I should, really shouldn't use Java because I really don't know the language. I'm going to print something to the command to the console which I think is the print command, but I don't know. In PHP, it's echo. Uh, but anyways, so you want to, in Java, you want to put something to the console right away. You'd literally go, you know, print two to the power of three. Out comes a number, right? In this, you can't do that. If you go echo a bunch of brackets, you're going to get nothing because you're not actually t telling it to access the value. You're just saying, I'm going to echo the fact I'm doing math, not what is the math doing. And the one below it is similar. Echo, dollar sign, the double brackets, and the piece of math. 
3 plus 6 times 5, which will output the value also. So if you want to do math, that's how you do math. So when you have it in one of the labs, where a couple of labs where they make you add stuff up, this is your slide. Um, by the way, what's 3 plus 6 times 5? Good. You're going to get the free prizes. You know when they make you the math test and the prizes? You're good to go. <laughs> okay. Exit status. So you created your program. And you want to make sure your command ran successfully. The exit status of the command is kept in the shell variable, reference with dollar sign question mark. What a useful variable name, eh? Literally, it's a question what? Dollar sign what? And dollar sign what means what the heck just happened? So if you run a command and it fails, it sets dollar sign question mark to 1. If it succeeds, it sets it to 0, which is kind of not intuitive. Because usually true is equal to what? When you think about Java or any other language, true is 1. False is. So the way this works is, did something bad happen? Yes. Did something bad happen? No. No means it was successful. It goes the other, it flips the logic around. So exit status, it's backwards of what you normally think, but essentially zero means it worked, one means it failed. The exit status actually can be anything from zero to 255, but anything more than a zero is a fail. Everything from 1 to 255 is different values you can set it to. And it tells you how badly you failed. If you failed with a 1, that's not bad. You fail with 255, you failed pretty hard. Uh, that's really not what it means. It's actually each value can mean something different depending on what program you're running. So, um, you know when you run... God, really? Uh, so, for example, you got a function in Java... And you get an exception when you run that function. And depending on what the error that comes out of it is, it tells you what you did wrong, right? For example, if you try to do a piece of math on a string, it's going to give you a certain kind of error code. In Java, they actually give you, like, words. Other languages, they don't give you words. They just give you an error code. For example, PHP and Python are notorious for their random, strange error codes. MySQL is really bad for that. So is Postgres, actually. For uh, those of you that actually took the time to read your error messages while you were doing your database labs, the, all of four of you, from my experience when I teach database, there's usually four in the class that take the time to actually read what those error messages mean. There's usually a number, and that number tells you what you know, the fail state is. And this has similar. So a lot of the command line utilities in Linux have multiple levels of fail. So depending on the level of fail, it tells you what went wrong. File is not accessible. File does not exist. You don't have permissions to read this file. That kind of stuff. The exit status is the most used in a script inside of itself, and usually it's part of an if statement, which we'll be exploring shortly. Um, and depending on the condition of the fail, you're going to branch your code. Um, did you guys learn about try catch in Java? Try catch fail? Level two? Do you have taught you about try catch fail? That's not good. Um, that's called error handling. No, you try this block of code. If it fails, you do this. Um, don't wrap your whole program in a try catch, by the way. That's terrible to do that. Um, basically, put we end up using that dollar sign question mark as part of the try catch. Because the cool part about bash scripts, it, even if the command you're trying to run fails, it's going to try to run the rest of the program anyways, unless literally the script is broken. Okay. You're going to love this. So, in 
Java, how do you, you use almost the same operators you have, they're similar operators to what you have in database, right, in SQL. They're pretty much the same operators you'd have in PHP or Python. However, in shell scripting, you don't have those. You have special commands instead. And here they are. Dash LT means less than. Dash LE is less than or equal to. So if you're not sure what that is, it's, you know, less than equal sign. Actually, hopefully I'm doing that right because I'm trying to do it backwards. That was greater than or equal, actually. But you know what I mean. You know, greater than, greater than or equal, equal, and, well, not equal. So those are basically the symbols you're going with. But instead of having symbols that you're all used to using, you got these weird little commands. And of course, what are the comparisons? There is the ability to do a comparison using the equal sign. But it's a single equal sign, not two equal signs. And when you want to use it, What's the difference between this compare, what I have here, and when you're assigning a variable? No, oh, that's a laser pointer. That's a marker. Eh? This, this, I'm going to put it up on the board so you have a, a visual example. This I shouldn't be using an equal sign because, well, you know. But no spaces you're assigning. You have spaces you're comparing. So if you suddenly have a bash script that's not doing what you want it to do, start looking at your spaces for all the dumb debugging things you can figure out because it's not even going to come up as an exception or as a syntax error. Why? Because it's perfectly valid. When it is going to bark though is if you have a space and no space or no space and a space then it's going to care and tell you you're out to lunch. Uh, not equals, same deal but you have to have spaces. Um, dash n. Is, it, is the string empty? or not. So dash n means not empty. Dash z mean is it empty? As in, is it zero length? Dash n is not zero length. Because, you know, it's obvious. So this would be the comparable to uh, when you're working with a string. Oh, I hope I call this one right. In Java, and you go variable dot length brackets. And you can get the length of the string. Maybe. I know that's what it is in C sharp, so I'm hoping it's the same in Java. I'm pulling stuff out of my, at random here, but I think I'm right on that one. So if you want to go, you know, variable dot length equal equal zero, that's the same thing as going dash z string one. There's a few other ones. They've, because this is, scripting language, it's got something specific to um, the file system. You can check see if a file is empty. Is it a file or is it a directory? Does the file exist? Is this a directory or is it a file? Go figure. You can check the other way. Is it writable, readable, or executable? WRX. RXW? Those letters sound familiar? It's the same as the permission masks. So in a few minutes, once I do the uh, test operators, like an if statement, you'll sh see these things in action. The echo command is how you print. Yay. Um, spacing between arguments means nothing. 
So you see how this was written with echo space this, was a couple of spaces, was, you know, more spaces will vary. It only respects the very first space. So it treats each of those words as a separate argument and ignores spaces between them. It just puts space between each one. Uh, if you've ever written stuff in P uh, with HTML, that's going to sound familiar. Anybody here taking the web dev course this term? You know when you're doing up your HTML and you put in a bunch of white space and it just shows you one space? And if you want to put more than one space, you put in a non-breaking space? And BSP is your friend? Basically, shell scripting is the same. If you actually want to have more spaces, you have to use quote marks. Like such. So if you enclose whatever it is you're trying to do between quote marks, it treats it as a literal string, as in this is now only one argument instead of a bunch of arguments. So before, this was very widely spaced with five arguments. It treated them as five separate words, so it only put one space between each word. But if when you put the quote marks on it, it treats it as a single argument, so it's only one string. And as you can see, single quotes, double quotes. They have the quotes actually do stuff, but essentially, as far as you're concerned, it's the same thing. Unlike Java, single quotes and double quotes mean something different. This is closer to uh, quote marks in PHP. Just remember, what's the most important rule when it comes to quotes? Yes, they have to match, and you have to close them. Close your quotes. Don't leave your quotes open. So when you echo something, by default, it always throws on a, a new line. So for those of you that don't know what that is, that's when somebody hits enter at the end of the line. So when you go echo whatever string, it literally outputs the line, goes to the next line. If you want to not make it go to the next line, you tell it don't by minus n. No new line. Um, there's a couple of other options you have. Uh, so dash e is expanded character checks. You can tell it don't ignore the back. You know, there's backspace. Get rid of any trailing new lines or force a new line. So it looks inside the string that you're trying to output, and it does a few nifty things. So backslash c says don't add a new line. Or you can add more than one new line by going backslash n, backslash n. You even go backslash b, where it types out what you typed in, and then it backs the cursor up and starts erasing what you typed in. I don't know why you'd want to, you know, but you could actually make it do that. So you could, help, you know, Jeffers. You know when you're uh, up, you're installing stuff on Linux, when you did your app get, and you could actually see the percent sign growing, where it go one percent, two percent, three percent, stayed in one spot. Guess what it's doing? It's going echo, no new line, one percent, echo backslash b, erases, echo two percent, no new line. It's just constantly rewriting the same spot on the screen using these kinds of characters. Now. If you want to retrieve something from the command line, so you're prompting someone for a value, so you know, enter grades for assignment one, you could go echo, semicolon, read my name. Now, if I were to do that, what's going to happen is it's going to go enter your name and then give you a command prompt, like a line where you start typing. However, a lot of people don't like doing that because it looks kind of dumb because you're prompting and it's on a separate line. You can use the read command instead, which obviously I'm already reading to, to do it, but you can use dash p for a prompt. So then it cuts it on a nice single line input. Um, dash s is silent mode. In other words, person is typing, but you can't see what they're typing on the screen. Uh, you've all experienced this. You know when you go SU and you type in a password or you change a password and it, you know you're typing and nothing's happening? It emulates that. So you could prompt someone for a password but not actually display it on the screen using dash S. Uh, dash T 
Time out. You've got five seconds to enter your name. Otherwise, I call you dumbass. You can time out the read so it doesn't stay stuck forever, which is a risk, right? When you have a bash script that runs and maybe um, some of the arguments are not important, so you fill out the first couple of arguments, then you hit enter and you walk away from your desk and you let the script finish. And if it's, you know, prompting for a couple of other things because it doesn't know what's happening, you can actually tell it after five seconds, just keep going. Ignore the set it to default values or whatever you want. Okay. Decision structures. In Linux shell scripting, how do we make a decision? If. But it looks more like a diff statement from Fortran or basic. If condition then, literally if then. Unlike what you guys are used to is if condition brace, close brace. This one here is if then. Then how do you end your if statement? Fi. Yes, sir, or ma'am. Somebody thought they were really cute when they went if. We start with if, we end with fi. We're going to reverse the if statement. If ends here. Um, actually, if the condition is true, anything inside the then block executes. You have the choice of if condition then, else, fi. You guys know how if then else works. You're not used to seeing it written like that, but you know exactly how it works. Okay, you can use and or not. And the good news is these should look familiar. Double ampersand for and, double pipe for or, bang for not. Uh, and as always, if you use and, both commands must execute and return to status of zero, otherwise it fails. With a double pipe, at least one has to be successful. And if you're using exclamation mark, it means it's the opposite. If this didn't work, do this. And if we do an else if, we can use elif. Um, it can't exist by itself, and that's what it looks like, just so you know. If condition, then do this. Elif, here's another condition, then do this. Elif condition two, well, then do this. Otherwise, do this. Phi, because you're done. If statements are brutal. Um, I do have examples of what the if statement, what the conditionals look like. Um, you can do command substitutions. So. Let's say you want to grab the contents from the output of a program. Dollar sign single brackets, not single dollar sign double brackets. Dollar sign single brackets. This language is, I don't know, it's self-explanatory because it, it's so dumb. Um, the output from the command substitute in place of that. So let's say you wanted a variable that has the current pro working directory. Instead of actually populating the variable or prompting for it, you could go dollar sign brackets pwd, and it treats the output of pwd as a variable. So if I go ls dollar sign pwd, it outputs the contents of the current working directory. It would be the same as if you typed in ls. Uh, however, let's say I want to take the contents of my listing and assign it to a variable. That you can do. t is equal to the ls of the present working directory. And suddenly, t is a variable that contains a file listing of what's in your current directory, and now you can work with it. There's, you can do stuff with it. OK. Here's a little example. I don't know when we went to example number two, because there was no example number one. Here's the first line bin bash. So you're telling it we're going to run this as a bash script. The next two lines is the comment to explain what this script is for. We're going to set the current the variable called dir1 to the present working directory. Then we do a logic check. And yes, 
square brackets. Not parentheses. Square brackets. So it's doing if dir1 is equal to home user1. Then echo, this is your, this is where you are. Otherwise, you're going to echo, no, really, you're here. It's a totally useless program. But it's nifty because it confirms that you are where you're supposed to be. And it shows you one of everything I spoke about almost in seven lines. You got an if statement, you got an echo, you've got a variable, you're outputting a string, you're running a shell command, you're doing comparison. All right, here's example number three. The good old, or do you want to continue prompt? And then, so I output a prompt that says, do you want to continue? I'm going to read yes, no. I'm going to read a single variable from the command line. I'm going to grab, read a value from the command line. I'm going to assign it to a variable called yes, no. If yes, no is equal to y, or yes, no is equal to capital Y. And you entered yes, otherwise you entered something other than yes. This little script handles every case known to man because unless you typed in y, it assumes you typed in not y and just outputs it. So this is how you do your comparison operator. I wish I could hang on here. Let's see if I can. Come on. Really? Oh, that's useless. That's supposed to let me uh, draw on the screw on the slide. Go PowerPoint. I was going to pull up my laser pointer instead. Okay. This right there is one condition operator. As you'll notice, there's a space after the if. Inside the square brackets, there's a space on each side. There's a space between the variable, the operator, and the value. This can also be a variable if you want. Just saying. Just like in Java, you can compare a variable to a variable. But the most important thing in all of this is the fact that it's all this white space. And after the square bracket, before the or, there's a space. When you're doing comparison operators, put spaces between everything. Otherwise, if there's no space right here, it's assuming you're doing an assignment operator and actually you can't assign dollar sign yes, no, because that's not how you assign a variable. You're going to get a weird error. Or it's going to work and it's just not going to do what you want it to do. All right. Slightly longer version, but this just shows the if, else, if, then. And Basically, if years is greater than or equal to zero, and it's less than five years, you know, you get paid 20 bucks an hour. If you've been working for five to 10 years, 30 bucks an hour. More than 15 years, well, 10 to 15 years, you get 35 bucks an hour. More than 15 years, you get 40 bucks an hour, and you know, obviously, the pay rate stops after 40. They're not going to pay you anymore, no matter how long you've been there. But this shows you every piece again. Make sure the space is between every piece of the comparison operator. And we've got that joyful greater than or equal, you know, for everybody on this side, the greater than or equal. And here's our and. And our, can't forget our closing fi, because your f statement's not completed without it. Now, we have one more operator, or decision-making system. It's the case statement. For those of you who don't know what the case statement is, switch in Java. And it's even more special than Java's version of switch, which is pretty special. Uh, I was told last year that Java finally allows you to compare against uh, strings in a switch statement. Apparently, that's a new thing. Um, 
So you could theoretically have multiple inputs, and you need to make decision based on you know the multiple inputs. Um, case word. Word's a variable. It has to match a certain pattern. And then you can actually use an asterisk to match all patterns, or a dollar sign to match a single character, or using a range. And if you're not sure what that means, that's literally we're talking about uh, regular expressions. Kind of, but not quite. No, for example, read prompt, do you want to see all the files, assigns it to yes, no. So now we have a yes, no. So, case yes, no, in. And we say lowercase y or uppercase y, but of course it's using a single pipe to separate them, not pipe pipe, because, you know, case special. Bracket, just the closing bracket, uh, parentheses. Do your code. You see the double... semicolons? That's the same as a break in your uh, switch statement. Right, how many of you have used a switch statement? I keep talking about like switch like you should know what I'm talking about. Okay, so the handful of you that were listening that put up their hand, good. The rest of you that may not have been listening, that may have used a switch, it's the same as a break statement. Then there are a second set of options is no, n, n, two versions of no. Displaying all files except what is hidden, so there's just the straight up ls, double, semicolon. The star at the end is the equivalent of uh, default in your switch statement. Um, so, you know, in your switch statement, you have the choice of having a default result at the end? No? Okay. Okay, good. It's like I'm talking to a wall. It's like, yeah, please say you understand what I'm talking about because it's going to get a lot longer. Um, in a bash script, if you want to use the default result, you use asterisk saying anything else is allowed from this point on. And then it'll echo invalid result, a couple of semicolons again. And how do you close the case statement? You reverse the word case. So case becomes ESAC because it hurts. I don't know why they chose to do it that way, but that's what they chose. So. You start with case, you end with ESAC. Just like you start with if and you end with phi. Why? I don't know. It's just the way it is. Here's another example. And the slideshow is on Brightspace, by the way. Um, and actually, the quote marks in these examples are actually good. They're not the weird ones. So. We're setting three variables for pricing. So we're determining the price of a movie ticket, and it hasn't been that realistic in years. If it gives you an idea how old this example is. When's the last time you paid 10 bucks to go see a movie? I, except for going to the Rainbow Theater out in saint Laurent. Eh? Not anymore. It's apparently, Cheap Tuesdays is gone. I was told by my kids. Yeah, Cheap Tuesdays doesn't exist anymore. If it's been a year. <laughs> A few theaters respected it a little longer, but Cheap Tuesdays is gone. I felt sad when I heard that. I felt old because I hadn't been in a theater in so long. Because I always teach on Tuesdays. Child price is five, adult price is ten, seniors pay six because, you know, they're not spring chickens anymore, but they shouldn't pay as much as the as regular adults. So we've set a few variables. As you notice, we actually put comments at the end saying a child should be zero to twelve. An adult should be 13 to 59. No, when you're 13, you're not an adult. We're just going to charge you 10 bucks because you're old enough to get a job. And seniors, is anybody over 60 to 99? Oh, this is kind of inappropriate. It assumes you stop going to the theater once you're 99 years old. But anyways, we're going to go with it because that's what the example has. So we're going to read for the person's age. Then we're going to go case age in. Then we're going to set a range. And this is a little wonky. I really wish I could highlight this on the right on the slide. Oh, I'm going to shut myself in the eye my laser. Okay. The first one is range 0 to 9. That means any value that is 0 to 9. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That is a valid value. Or 
just for you guys on this side. Or see this in here where it has a one and then a range? So, or it's the next, the input, it starts with one and the next character is zero to two. Not zero minus two, zero to two. So that means that'll handle 10, 11, or 12. Yes, Katie, it made me hurt too, but I read it the first time. And then you output the price based on the variable up here. So 13 to 19, one is the teen, three to nine, so 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Or any number that starts from two to five and ends in zero to nine. And then we've got any number that starts with, that I'll put the adult price, anything that starts with six or to nine, so 60, 70, 80, 90 and any of the smaller digits inside that range. So anything from 60 to 99 will output that price. Apparently, if, you're, if you don't fit into this bracket, in other words, you're zero, you're zero years old, you're um, negative one years old, or you're 100 years old, you're not allowed to go to the theater. Because we're not handling centennials in this. But this is how you do, you check for multiple values or multi-spaced numbers. Yes? Yes, in a case statement. And notice, it's hard to tell on here, there's no space. There's no space on either side of the pipe symbol. So it's bracket zero, nine bracket, pipe, no space. No space, bracket one, close bracket, bracket, 0 dash 2, close bracket, closing parenthesis, saying this is where the case statement starts. It outputs some stuff, double semicolons. This is all stuff you've seen kind of in Java, but just not this stupid. Actual fact, this is kind of a cute trick because this is actually uh, something you can't really do in Java. Because in Java, you can do case statements, but they have to be set values. You can't do an expression as part of your case. You can't say, switch on this variable case, variable less than 10, variable greater than 10, variable, you know. Then you'd use a NIF statement for that kind of stupidity. Uh, that stuff you can do, but you can do this in Perl, Python, and PHP, go figure. Uh, you also can't do that in C, by the way. Uh, it's one of the few cases where Bash is actually a more powerful language than Java or C because you can do stupid stuff like this. Um, okay, so we've done loops, we've done conditionals, we've output stuff, we set some variables. What's the point of having a Bash file if you can't take parameters? For example, ls space dash a. That's a parameter. Uh, or ls dash a space slash home. That's how many parameters? Dose. Right? Dash a is one parameter. The path you want to ls is also a parameter. With bash scripts, you can have 10 parameters, but not really. You actually have nine parameters. Because parameter zero, because all arrays are zero based, unless you're working in basic, then they start at one. All arrays start at zero. Parameter number zero is the name of the script itself. So the script knows what its name is. How does it know? Dollar sign zero tells it, this is who you are today. Hot damn, I know who I am. One through nine is the different arguments you can feed it. So you can have nine arguments to your script. You'll care about this for lab 10, just saying. So the way parameters work is, for example, positional parameters separated by space. 
a single line is a command, right? So you know when you're at the command line and you type in ls space slash home. It's on one line, right? And the parameters come in order from left to right. So parameter zero is the command you're running. The next parameter is the first argument, second argument, third argument, going on and on. So if you were to type in the command display it space a space b, dollar sign zero is display it, a is one, b is two. If I had c, d, and f, that'd be three, four, and five. If you want to pass more than nine variables, you can shift them. Now, how many of you are old enough to remember DOS? Real DOS. Okay, that's three. Yay, four. Nah, you're, you're doubting. You don't remember. Okay, those of us that are old enough, remember a couple things about DOS. Um... There once was a time where a hard drive couldn't be more than 250 megabytes. So you had to install special software to read a drive that was like 500 megabytes. Not gigabytes, megabytes. And this software actually moved a window across the hard drive by shifting the address of the drive. So suddenly, you know, even though you're accessing, you know, megabytes 1 to 250, you wanted to get at, say, megabyte 400, you'd move the window and megabyte 400 became megabyte zero. And you were reading from, so the window moved on the drive. So that's, you know, those that are old enough to remember hard drives measured in megabytes, you know, do you remember all this weird stupidity that you have to install? It's called, it's called uh, drive, exp uh, drive space. And that's how you moved it. They use something similar. If you want more than nine arguments, you use shift. So after you get to nine, you can go shift n. So it takes the nine arguments and it'll move over left. So if you go shift one, parameter two becomes one, parameter three becomes two, four becomes three. So take the parameter numbers and negate them and then whatever's past number nine starts eating up into nine. So you're shifting your arguments. So here's an example. If we had a command called shift them, and you allowed nine parameters, obviously, echo one through nine. Then if you did a shift, you echoed one through nine. So if you ran the command shift, shift them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, the first time we would run, because we didn't shift yet, it would go up at one to nine. After we shift, we're doing two to ten. One is gone. It's been pushed off the stack. And again, if we do a shift three, you can see right here what's going to happen. So we fed in numbers one to tw the first time you output gives you one to nine. You shift by three, suddenly we're outputting four to 12. One, two, three is gone, missing an action. Um, normally, you don't write scripts that require more than nine arguments. That's, you know. Room for error. Lots and lots of errors. It is what it is, right? Um, there is special parameters. And they're preceded with a dollar sign because they act like a variable. The first one is pound sign, hash mark. Dollar sign, hash mark tells you how many arguments were passed in. So you know how we had dollar sign one to nine? And we only fed one, two, and three? Dollar sign pound mark tells you that they passed in three arguments. So you don't need to test for all nine. You can just check for how many were passed in. And if, let's say, your script requires four arguments, but the person only typed in three, you can say, oh, you didn't give me enough arguments. No, try again. You got to feed me these arguments. Uh, we already talked about dollar sign question mark. That's what the heck just happened. And double dollar sign gives you the PID. 
if you, the PID is the process ID. Every process in Linux is given a number. After you reboot your machine, it starts at 1. And every time a single anything launches, it's given a new number. And the number just keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And it now doesn't reuse the old PIDs. It just keeps growing. And you can reset it. So some of you may have had problems when you were uh, having some shellception going on during Lab 7. Not pointing anybody out, but there's four people that had this problem. So if you thought you were the only one, don't feel bad. Um, by that I mean, you know, you went SU, user 502, SU, SU, user 502. Suddenly your user 502 inside of root, inside of root. Sorry, your root inside of user 502, inside of root, inside of user 502, inside of root. And suddenly you try to delete the user and it didn't work and it's saying you, telling it's, you know, it's, it's locked by a process. So then uh, some of you discovered I ran a, P it got you to run a PS command. And the PS command lists all the processes that are currently running. So you can actually check what the current shell is that, that's running the script and ask it, what's my ID? Who am I? What's my SIN number, essentially? So then you can refer to it by SIN number and you can actually kill it if you wanted to using the kill command. So you can get the script to commit suicide. It's a terrible line to use. That's why I hesitated. But it's literally what you can do. Halfway through the script, you can go, let's say it's pit is 345. You can go kill space 345. Guess what just happened? The script self-terminated. It is. That's what you'd use it for. So if you discover your script is acting kind of funny partway through and something's not right, you can actually kill it. Uh, you can also do a kill dash nine, which is kill immediately and don't give it a chance. Um, different kill commands. Uh, oh wow, example number one just showed up to the party at the end of the slideshow. So that was the first example I was supposed to show you like seven, like seven slides ago. Um, but not quite, because you can see in here we've got the dollar sign um, pound mark. If number of arguments is equal to zero, echo, you must supply at least one argument. Exit one, as in the script ends and it says, hey, it didn't work right. You did something wrong. Phi. If test dollar sign greater than one. In other words, this is the other way. So you know how you guys, are, earlier I showed you how to do an if statement using the square brackets? You can also go if test if you don't want to use square brackets. This is equivalent to that. The only problem you're going to have is it's really hard to add or statements with this syntax, whereas with this it's really easy to add the or statements as long as you remember to put in the spaces in the right spots. Then the number is positive, otherwise the number is non-positive. So this forces you to enter a value, and if it works, great. Okay, everybody's brains is melted. Um, so a few quick announcements to wrap things up for the half the class that is not here. Um, you should be wrapping up Lab 7 sooner than later. Due to various circumstances, the lab dates have slid a little bit. So I'm not really writing the lab, the lab due dates all that much. Uh, but Lab 7, I think, is due next week. Um, 7, or is it due tonight? Oh, OK, tonight then. <laughs> I'm going to go add another week. Because some people are all over the place uh, between other courses eating up weird time and, you know, stuff like that. Um, so after this, you should be working on labs um, 8, 9, and 10. Now with labs 8, 9, 10, um, lab 8 has a weird wording in it. It says, if your student number is even, do this lab. No, you're doing this lab. 
There once was a time, and when they handed me the course, where there was two different labs for lab eight. Odd numbered students did lab A, even numbered students did lab B. And I thought it was a waste of time because students couldn't help each other. The point of it was to avoid students copying each other's labs and try to submit it as their own lab. Yeah, half, uh, I'm guessing 10% of the group's still going to do that. The number of, uh, insert word here I give, is basically non-existent because when you go to do it in the real world, you'll screw yourself. So it's not my problem if you don't want to put in the effort. Two, I'll even have students that are bold enough to come up with the same laptop at two different points in the, during the, like, the lab period. I've seen that. How do I know? A uh, chunk of your laptop is missing. I'm going to notice the fact because I notice when people's laptops are falling apart. And you bring me a two, uh, the same broken laptop for two different people, I'm not that dumb. You might think I'm dumb. I've been around for a while. Experience counts for something. Old, I might be getting old and slow, but I'm not stupid. So try to do these labs yourself. They're programming labs. I mean, the logic in it is exactly like you've been doing in the other courses. The syntax is weird. Welcome to the club. We're always learning in this industry. If you want, the easy way to get your grade is come to me and do a demo during a lab period or at the end of a lecture. I will look at your lab. I will test it. If it does what it's supposed to do, I give you your mark. I, I will then get you to show me your source code real quick to make sure it's not the same as the person came right before you. I've also had people submit labs with somebody else's name in the comments. That's a really good way to make sure both of you get zero. Students are lazy. I know. Not saying you're all lazy. I'm just saying you know, there's a percentage that will attempt things like that. So don't do that. At least put in the effort to change your name if nothing else, and your student number. Show it to me. I'll make sure it's valid. I give you your points right then and there, free to run. Uh, historically, what people have been doing is they'll do lab eight while they've got their brains wired in right. They'll do lab nine, and they try to do lab 10, which is a little harder because there's some a little bit of material that you need for the next couple of presentations. But the slides have everything you need, so some people just refer to the slides and try to do all three labs in one go. Honestly, I think it's the better way to do it than trying to do one one week and then take a week off and go back to a language that looks like it's been put through a blender. And then, you know, wait another week. Once again, go back to the blender, add some extra spinach to it, and see what happened. So, yeah. So... Basically put, I'm going to change the due dates for 8, 9, and 10 to make them do all on the same day. So you basically you've got three weeks to do labs 8, 9, and 10. Um, I have one other announcement. The second last lecture may be canceled. Or it may be moved to a smaller room. Um, there was issues with one of the Java profs. Some of you have heard. Some of you have experienced. And the person who took over that class is looking for lecture periods. And he's asking a bunch of us that have later in the day lecture periods, see if we can give up our lecture period. So if I get the yes, because I don't actually have any content for the second last week. <laughs> so that's it. Like after la lecture 10, we're done content-wise. So two more lectures. But there's, you know, four more classes. So I usually use that as a catch-up class where, you know, you got problems, come and see me. I'll help you with your script. So, I mean, worst comes to worst, I'm trying to get booked into another classroom so that I can just have the uh, swinging doors. Um, but that's, you know, what there is to say about that. Um, other than that, sorry I melted your brains, but, you know, you guys should know how to program somewhat by now. It's just learning the syntax difference. And uh, free to go. Uh, there will be a review period last week before the exam. And the week before, two weeks before that, I'll be giving you guys the breakdown of the exam so you know what you need to start studying. 